the seventh generation of water, okay, um, we, we have, I'm, I'm the spiritual advisor for a nonprofit that, that uh, we, we created. It's called the White Horse Creek Council. And like I said, we, we try to make a positive impact through that. It's, it's uh, like I, uh, Ryan was saying, if, you got, if anybody couldn't make donations, also uh, leave your contact because uh, we can write you a receipt for a tax deductible, you know, uh, you can get, get it deducted from uh, your taxes. Uh, it's, it's a 501c3, so that's another thing that I wanted to bring up. And anything else you want to add? I mean, it might be, I'm back to Standing Rock. I wasn't actually there, but I know that, that you were, I don't know if um, anybody else was, was there, but maybe you could talk about the, the way that it started. I think it was started by three, three young girls. Yeah. And then also, like, I don't know if people over here in California, a lot of people don't even know. Like, I mentioned Standing Rock when it was going on, and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. And it's like, well, it wasn't really covered on the news for a long time, and there's reasons for that. Maybe you can talk about that. But what, I, what made an impact on me is seeing how, like, like a few people stood up for this because it, it affected them, and then it really was a different kind of thing. It something happened. It, it galvanized, and you had, I don't know the numbers exactly, but it went from a few hundred people to like. 10, 20, 30, 40,000 people or something. No, uh, we estimated the campsite, uh, Ocheti Shakoni by itself, we estimated at, uh, what is that, 15,000? Yeah, I was gonna say 10 at least. 15, yeah, I think I think uh, I heard 15,000 yeah, yeah. when it maxed out. Just that one camp, it yeah. one camp, so yeah. Yeah, it maxed out at 15,000. And most of them were young people, you know, from late teens all the way up to the 30s, you know. Yeah, and then the veterans came. And one of the things that up there, you know, there was no, we had, um, uh, if, if some kind of emergency came up, uh, we, we, we couldn't depend on the police. We couldn't depend on highway patrol or anybody because they were on the other side. They were for, working for the oil companies. So if somebody murdered somebody within, you know, in that town or did some kind of uh, a crime, we couldn't call anybody because there was nobody to call, you know? We even called Bismarck and they said, call the police, call 911. Well, 911 was a cross trying to kill our young people. You know, they were shooting at our young people. And there was tear gas and there was uh, rubber bullets and there was water canyons and sound canyons and everything possible. They tried to say that they don't, you know, that was just a deter, but they were the ones that were trying to hurt, uh, you know, hurt our young people. Uh, as a leader up there, I was expected not to go to the front because what they do is they get leaders and then capture them and put them in jail to make a point. They have a, one of our young people up there right now, uh, and a lot of them are still going to court. But in order to make a point, this, this is what can happen to anybody that violates this law. But there was no law because our civil rights were violated, our human rights were violated, uh, there was elderly abuse, there was animal abuse. They shot, they shot up horses, so you, know, you had to take them down to get them out of their misery. You know? they, they, they were going for headshots for our young people, and that's how one young lady almost lost her whole arm. Um, my son got shot in the, in the face, but he had a face shield on, and it hit right on the face shield. And they were going for headshots, they were going for kill shots. You know, a lot of people, we got them back in uh, to the medics and, the, uh, and I'm sure glad that a lot of people supported us, doctors, nurses, medics, um, people that were there to, to help with the young people. And, and uh, uh, they brought us back over there and if it was an emergency, then they had to take them into the reservation hospital. And, and, and at first, the tribal police were helping us, but then again, they turned their back and because of the situation, they were put between a rock and a hard place. The government said, are you gonna, uh, are you gonna, uh, um, if, if, if you don't support us, we're, we're, we're gonna stop supporting you. And so they had to go on the other side. They had, you know, I, I know the tribal, the chairman, uh, Dave Arshamble, I know what he went through. A lot of people got mad at him because he turned his back on the, 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 the water protectors. But 
The reason they did that was because I know they put him in a hard place. You know, well, we're going to stop funding your reservation if you don't support us and start to, to capture or to hurt people. So that's what he did. He turned his back on us. And also, sorry to add it. It should, it should be known or stated that the Lakota and, and everybody that was involved in that had a strict rule of, um, of no weapons. Yeah. So, so there's all kinds of protests around the world, and lots of times they get violent on both sides. Um, but it's a different kind of person who would choose to um, stand up for the essence of life, you know, water, mini uh just armed with, you know, sage and prayer and um, the chinupa, the sacred pipe. And I know at one time he, he was there, um, again, I wasn't there, but I know I've heard from other people too that at one time there was a, a circle of, of chinupas of uh, around 500 people. Yeah, uh, that's, that's an amazing, just an amazing weapon. <laughs> it's prayer. We, uh, and 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 I had to have a lot of meetings with a lot of different groups, and and told them we have to stay in prayer because a lot of these people said, okay, well, enough's enough. We're gonna go attack. I was like, violence isn't gonna solve anything. It's gonna get get us killed. Because when I first got there, remember when I was telling you about Keystone XL pipeline, and then Dapple came up when I got there. Uh, the first uh, two days, and this is, is, is not timing, or, or it's, it's not, I don't know, it's coincidence. It's, it's coincidence. It's, it's, the next day after we camped, uh, what I said was I was going to take my chinook and my eagle staff. But the first day, the, 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 uh, the caretaker of our sacred chinook was there. We had a meeting, and we all marched to the, where the pipeline was supposed to cross, the main area. And that first day, I carried my chinook. No, first day I carried the staff, and, and we, we got there and we prayed, and I got my chinupa, and there were seven chinupas, seven eagle staffs. I was like, wow, this is, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's not planned, but it happened that way, seven. The next day, I thought there was going to be more, and here we did the same thing. That time I carried my chinupa, and my son carried the eagle staff, and we went up there, and we did seven again, seven chinupas. Of all those chinupas and of all those spiritual leaders, how did seven just show up? So when that day two happened and we went back, I was like, all right, I completed what I committed to. Because it wasn't Keystone, but this one pulled me and so I finished. So the next morning, the third morning, we were gonna leave. I got up from the tent and it was just before, you know, as it's getting daylight. And usually I go a face east and I say, a, you know, sometimes a short prayer, sometimes long prayer, just sometimes a little bitty prayer. I looked to the east and all of a sudden for that feeling made me look north. And as I look north, because that's where they, you know, the front line sort of like where uh, the, the action people, uh, the, I looked that way and the vision came to me. A vision was in, from 1890, a wounded knee when they opened up and killed all the people. That came to me and I teared up and I cried and I, uh, I prayed more. I really got emotional. And, and then I, 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 I sat there, and I sat there, and I prayed until it came up. And then finally my son came out, and he says, what time are we leaving? I said, we're not. Because it, to God, the Creator sent me a vision that what, what, what could happen right there? What, what's going to happen? We need to stay here and protect people. And so I said, we're not. And, and altogether, I stayed there for you know, three months, a little over three months. And uh, during that time, when everybody was trying to attack and be violent, the Creator sent me another vision. At three o'clock in the morning, He sent me a vision. And it wasn't good. Some people they said, if we turn violent, it's gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna all gonna uh, perish. So you better stay in prayer. That's when I started having meetings. And I was like, we gotta stay in prayer. Because prayer can save us. And I stayed all the way through, all the way, you know, almost to Christmas. And, and that's when we knew that it only took a little bit of time before everything went back. That pipeline, that black snake, the prophecy of the black snake was going to go through. Did it go through? Yeah. Yeah, it, um, it went through, and now we pray that it doesn't break until it's changed. And it, like I said, it, it's, it's going to change through prayer. It's not going to change through violence. It's, it, you know, it's, it's going to take a lot of prayer from a lot of people. And that's what the young people want. 
that's what we have to support them in, you know, through prayer. And, and, and up there, I said, let's stay in prayer, let's stay in prayer and everything. But during that whole time, when I first got there, um, first, uh, uh, the Oglala camp sent me to the main camp to see what's going on. So when I was doing that, the main camp and the chairman of that tribe said, okay, well, I, it was four men elected, three dropped out. Uh, they had issues, so they weren't there. Only one person, so I kept on going him. I even adopted him as a, as a cousin. <laughs> And uh, they put us both in charge. You know, they, they said, you're, you're, you're our connection to what's going on here. And I, because I brought the Department of Justice in, because we needed legal eyes to, to make sure that none of our people got killed, that if they did, you know, they had, we had the legal eyes, legal observers to, to verify that. And we had other observers from uh, other, you know, organizations, uh, what is that? The one uh, or world? Uh, what was that one organization? They, uh, it's like a world. Uh, uh, oh, I'm not sure. Yeah, there's there's a there's a few of them. We even had five hundred. Watch, watch, uh, <coughs> watchdog kind of organization. Yeah, uh, Greenpeace was there too. Uh, there's a whole bunch of yeah, uh, different. Yeah, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, different organizations that were there. To, to observe, and I said, that's what we need, you know, to observe, to see and verify what they're doing to our young people, everybody. And at that same time, they elected us to go and um, the Department of Justice set it up so we could talk to the other side. Because of rumors, they said, well, we have pipe bombs and weapons and all this, and we thought that they, had, they were gonna call the National Guard in, and we heard that they were gonna come in force, and. And they said, no, we're not gonna call the National Guard, and they did it anyway. So um, we had to go over there, and uh, uh, the, they sent a representative from the tribal office. So we, uh, we met with uh, uh, the sheriff, uh, the FBI, the uh, US Marshal Service, the head of the BIA from Washington, a representative from the governor of uh, North Dakota. Um, what's that? Uh, Tobacco firearms. What's oh, ATF. The ATF. Uh, uh, and there was a couple more. But w they were all on the table, and just the two of us had to confirm all that and, and, and talk to them and make sure that nobody, nobody got hurt. They told us nobody would get hurt, and they still hurt. You know, they still tried to kill our young people. So that's where the violations, all these violations came from. Even the representative from the United Nations w went up and said, they're violating your rights, and they verified that. So I understood that no matter what, we need a strong force to make that change because, and that's the seventh generation again, because if we try to do something in a smaller group, the U.S. government is going to take us out. You know, it, it don't matter to them if they take out a couple million, you know, it, 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 don't make, it don't matter. To them, it doesn't matter as long as they've got that oil, as long as they have that power. So it's gonna take a lot of people. So that's what we've seen, that's what we experienced, that without law, we don't, we're not protected. We, we're not, you know, it could change. You, you think you were safe with a police, uh, a police force around here, but that can change. You know, that can change like that because the government. And, and government right now, I think, is having problems with California, right? You know, that's why I'm proud of California because, gotta, you know, it's like, you know, you're not going to do this to us. We're tough, <laughs> you know. That's why I love California. So anyway, uh, so somebody was gonna sing. Yeah, Monique, are you are you ready and willing? Yeah. Right on. Do you you want to introduce yourself? Monique's gonna sing a song. Uh, Why? Well, I guess she should introduce it. But did you write this yourself? I did. Ish. 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 I don't. Okay. I don't take ownership of this. Okay. You, you, you can turn. Explain. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let, let me know how I can help. Yeah. You can turn this off. I think. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Hello, my name is Mom. 
Monique Benabou. Um, I am a conscious artist and I create conscious media. Um, I channel most of my music and my transmissions via meditation and ceremony work. Um, a lot of my friends and my family were over in Standing Rock when things were kind of climaxing and I was not able to go over there myself and support with them. And I felt incredibly hopeless and I felt incredibly helpless and incredibly frustrated. Um, I don't know if there are those in this room that are like me where I'm incredibly sensitive and I can feel something happening in Africa, something happening just on a global level. I, I'm very tapped in to this um, cosmic pulse, this global pulse. Um, and so when I was seeing coverage from my friends and my family and getting messages, I was just really devastated and I didn't know what to do. Um, and so I prayed. And I remember being in my car. I live in Venice, California. And I remember being in my car and it started raining. And I was so heavy. And I, my body was acidic and I was feeling all this fire. And I just remember not, well, I was parking to go into the gym. And I couldn't bring myself to go into the gym because of how heavy I felt. And I just started crying and praying. And as I was crying and praying, it was raining. And I just asked for some way to transmute this energy, this pain that I was feeling um, from all that I was witnessing secondhand. That night I went into a Reiki meditation and I invited my guides and my angels and my spirit to, my higher spirit to come in and, and bring me something bring me messages, offer me a medicine that I could offer back, a uh, call to action, if you will, to help the seventh generation, my generation, to wake up. Um, and this song, this transmission, came through. This is why I don't claim that it's mine, and I don't usually claim that my music is my music, because it's gifted to me. Um, so this song is called Black Snake. Let the cold, let the cold of the water that hits my skin ricochet onto the face of hate. Oh, Mama Kia, may your tears of silver wash them away. All my brothers and sisters of different misters, please come together to stand at the river. Pray to the heavens to deliver the presence from every direction. We are protected and we won't let you 
those horses that were in the clouds that were coming. And uh, it's a message that say that uh, they're, they're coming to uh, help me into the spiritual path. And uh, uh, that's all I can say. You know, those horses, they're on the clouds coming from the west. So now I, uh, I get my medicine from the west. The Joaquin Oyate is what we call, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Joaquin Oyate is uh, what we call the thunder beings. And uh, they're, they help, they help me in the altar. So, yeah. And, um, uh. Did the Lakota believe in reincarnation? Um, go? Okay, what, what, uh, what happens is, um, you know, we, we have a learning lesson in life, and everybody does that, and, you know, everybody goes through that a lesson in life. Yeah, and, and so you get to a certain point where, if, if at all possible, you, you prepare yourself for the next world. Okay, so when you get to that point, prepare yourself and be as, as in, like I said, follow the, the, the Lakota values. Try to be helpful, have compassion, respect, everything like that. You get, and through prayer, you get to that point, and then you're, you're, it's, it's, it's a, a good journey across. Some of the ones that go early in life, uh, the younger they are, the more sacred they are, so they, they journey across really good. Now, the ones that commit suicide um, stay here. And some of them, um, if you haven't really gotten to that point where you have that good, easy journey across the other side, then what happens is you start over. And, you, they, 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 and, and that's where you know, you can come back as anything to, to prepare in this world and, and, and to, to, to try it again because the Creator wants you to succeed one way or another. And so they come back and try it again to see if you make it across again. But the ones that, that, that um, There goes another one, hey. but uh, what it is is if if, if uh, uh, the person that say per person murders this other person, well that person left early, so they are through prayer get to the other side. You know their life is ended early, but it's not their fault. The one that killed that person is the one that's going to start over again, uh, or what we call in between here and there, and they're they're there, they're stuck, they're. They, only, they ain't got no chance, you know. So that's why in a spiritual path, we say that uh, nobody can't take anybody's blood. If you have blood on your hands, then you can't have a chinupa. Uh, uh, if you have blood on your hands, you, you, you can't have anything done with the ceremony because then the, the negativity passes on to the ones that are trying to make a positive impact. So, mm -hmm. anybody else? Huh. Oh, I just, I'll, uh, maybe it's too early, so that's fine, but I just wondered, is there any more about the book you guys are working on, biographical, or the Lakota spiritual, or, it's, just curious. It's, um, it's more of a dialogue uh, format between me and I, oh, and okay. um, I gotta say, I gotta stand up and say this, because I forgot to say this earlier, so I'm glad you brought this up. I really have to thank Claire. Yes. She's helped transcribe hours and hours and hours of interviews that he and I have had. And um, I'm already, I have a, a deep philosophical background. I consider myself a philosopher. But, uh, so I understand a lot of abstract thought, but still I need to be able to understand in the Lakota way in order to write and convey his message. So I'm doing it through, through uh, interviews and she's transcribed all of them for me to go through and put them on in writing. She also 
offer tonight and set up tonight uh, for, uh, I don't know if you guys saw some of the emails that she does um, conscious captioning. So for the hearing impaired, people can come to any talk like this or any seminar anywhere, and her and her team will, will put captions up for people that are hearing impaired. So I have to thank her for, for that as well. Woo! But to answer your question, um, yeah, it's uh, right now. It's it's a lot. It's a lot of his personal. It's biographical or autobiographical. Um, but we go into we interweave some history, although it's not about history. But we, inter we interweave a lot of his family history, and about the history there is really not so much about like um, dates and, and times and events, but more about like the the psychology of life. Uh, on the reservation in Manderson, White Horse Creek, Pine Ridge, at that time of America for the Lakota people. Because it's, it's really different than, say, the way I grew up. Um, and so someone who reads this is going to get a perspective of what life is like, like carrying water in buckets from, from a, a fresh stream and using a horse to get around. And, uh, his, his, uh, one of his grandfathers actually built a house like into the hill, the hillside, sunk the house in there because it was a great way to thermoregulate the temperature in the middle of winter. And just those little kind of things. So, um, so it is autobiographical. It is a dialogue, sort of back and forth, because I ask a lot of spiritual, spiritually based questions like reincarnation, um, because my mind is syncretic, and I'm always, I'm always seeing this, the syncretization of, of all theologies or spiritualities. And basically, like he said, there's, there's one great spirit. And we might have cultural differences in the way we dress that spirit or address that spirit, the way we name it or, or talk to it, or, or even in the way we pray. And so I personally tried a whole bunch of different philosophies and theologies, and I've walked along different paths. And um, some of them called to me. And some of them are really effective, and some of them have just done, haven't done anything for me at all. And so I, I'm really close to this path because of the, some of the things that he and his family and his ancestors about have passed down. I feel very fortunate to be able to tell his story and um, from his perspective, his words, you know, but also to um, try to make it readable for an American Western audience. It's going to have, you know, current, modern, um, what do you call it, nomenclature. So uh, we're about three quarters of the way through a rough edit. We still need to add some more history about Standing Rock. And we, we have interviews of other people, other than him, that need to be put in there, family members and other spiritual leaders. Um, and then there's also a lot of things we can't talk about because you can't, we can't talk about certain things in ceremony uh, because they are sacred. So it's a little bit of a dance to get those words on paper, but not get those words on paper mm -hmm. in a respectful way. So it is. It, it's going to be great. <laughs> Hopefully, you guys will. Uh, Do you have a title picked out for the book? Uh, at first, we thought it was going to be um, Hechetu, Hechetu Elo. Hechetu or Hechetu Elo, that's the way it is. But, you know, a lot of people don't really know that word. So I'm just going to talk to him about it and we'll just keep it Plenty Wolf Medicine, right? Yeah, it, yeah, it may be Plenty Wolf Medicine, it may be Hechetu or Hechetu Elo the way it is. Um, those are the two working titles we have right now. Yeah. Yeah, so, like I said, it's, uh, they'll be out next week. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> This is Lee's 29th year of, of uh, actually participating in leading Sundance. And he does all kinds of other ceremonies too. He does the ceremonies and uh, funerals and weddings and adoption ceremonies and uh, rites of passage ceremonies. And, um, but the Sundance is a really, really powerful ceremony. And he, on his 29th year, he's going um, to be adorned as a chief with full headdress this year. So. It's a great honor. It's not something 
I don't, I, you know, I, you kind of have to look at it the way that other uh, uh, spiritual orders do things. It's, it's different. It's, you can't, you can't get a chinooka because someone gives it to you. You can't get a chinooka because you want one. Um, you can't pour for a lodge because you want to. It's like every step along the red road or the Lakota path. And other Native American um, tribes as well. It's, everything has to be earned. And so there's a lot of um, a lot of tests that are put upon you, but those tests are not put upon you by your fellow man or woman. They're put upon you by creator. Mm -hmm. So when you walk this this way, you are walking alone in a sense. It's, it's a very soft path. That's, that's why it's such a beautiful path. Because you, you will go as far as your commitment will take you. And and um, everybody has their, their way of supporting. You don't have to be you don't have to have a chinooker to be powerful and terrible. You know, there's a lot of different roles that people can play, but Tokashila, the grandfather, um, sort of does elect certain people that have that will and are willing to go that far. And you know, he's one of those people. So um, if, that, if that helps, but every order, every you know, sort of church or tradition has has steps. You can become like a bishop or or a priest or a monk, and there's all these different steps. So in the Lakota way, it's it's action oriented. It's it's not it's not something like you, you get knowledge by by reading or by uh, there is an oral tradition, so you do get knowledge handed down to you, but it's much more it's much more experiential. So if you get a concept, or you get a teaching, or you get taught something, you may have an understanding of it, but you really don't until you've experienced whatever that, not where that knowledge came from. Like someone might be giving it to you because they experienced that. You might understand it, but if you haven't actually experienced how they got that knowledge, you actually don't have that knowledge. You just have awareness of that. So it's a very, it's a very sacred, it's a very old and indigenous, indigenous wisdom. You know, it comes from, it comes from the connection uh, of, of us through spirit with the earth, which is our, our most honest and greatest reflection. And it's a big, it's a big cycle, and it goes around and around and around and around eternally. And um, you have to experience that in order to gain this, this type of. Yep, you said that? Yeah. I was wondering how you were going to explain that. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you very much for being here tonight. And thank you, Solsky well, and um, Eve, for this beautiful night. Uh, my question is you, you mentioned how difficult it is sometimes to have a calling that you might not understand or um, a pull. Uh, so when you have a sense of urgency, like you, you want to just go to that pole right away, but you have a lot of fear, and then fear starts to um, block you. What, what, what teachings or advice do you have to, to really be able to distinct, you know, extinguish the fear, fear quickly to, to move towards the pole? Prayer. Prayer. Prayer, and if you don't understand why, what it is that you're, is, you're being pulled, why you're being pulled, or what, what the reason is for you being pulled in that direction. Through prayer, you ask the Creator for clear, uh, clearancy. So it'll send you another vision or dream. When you sleep, you dream. And there's a difference between a regular dream, a crazy dream, uh, a nightmare, and a sacred dream. You know, so you understand that when you, you'll know it. So when you ask for that through prayer, they'll send you another one to better clarify that and what, what you need to do. And it, it might not come right away, it might take a while, but it, then again, it could come right away. So in prayer, you ask the Creator, you know what, I need to understand this because I really don't understand why I'm in fear of why the, I'm being pulled this way or why this dream is, I can't understand it. So it, they clarify it a little bit more. And through prayer, you can overcome that. That's within you, you know. And and granted, we all we all fear something. I mean, you, when uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, 
I'll give you an example. When, when I think it was my first, I think it was my second year. I had I was up. I put on the hill, Vision Quest, and I was up there. And uh, before then, I was scared of death. I was scared of darkness. I was scared of the thunder, thunder, lightning. And I was put up there, and uh, the second night it came. First, you know, and I knew it was coming. I had to go. I had to stand there all night, you know, uh, uh, and and all day and all night. And next day I was supposed to be pulled, you know, I'm taken down. I knew that darkness was coming, so I prayed hard. I was like, and then all of a sudden the thunder were coming. And I was like, oh man, you know, and I'm scared to death too, you know. And there, yeah, I, everything blew up, you know, and it got there. Dark came. Thunder, rain, lightning. I was like within the lightning. So I, I prayed. I prayed hard and I cried and I prayed. And about, I'd say, half hour into that prayer and I cried, cried and prayed. All of a sudden I felt something like being uh, something poured over my head. It's that warm feeling that came through the, my whole body, went out my arms and my hands and, and all the way through my legs and out my feet. As soon as it left my feet, I wasn't scared no more. And it was like, thank you. Uh, everything was beautiful, you know. And then it went by and then, you know, the afterthought, the main front went by in little sprinkles and I was like, the next thing was like, Okay, but when I when the whole storm was coming through and I was praying, I was standing there. Finally, I sat down and I held my chin up here like this, and I sat down and I prayed and I prayed. The rain came down hard, lightning, everything, and I cried. And that's when all this happened, you know. And and uh, then my next thought after everything was beautiful, I thought, oh no. I'm going to be soaking wet by 5 o'clock in the morning when it's cold. I'm going to be freezing, you know. And the blanket I had was a, you know, a, it wasn't thick. It was just a regular blanket, you know. And um, uh, while it was raining, I felt the inside, and I went like this, and I was like, I'm dry. You know, well, how come this blanket isn't soaking through? So I put my hand out, and I went like that, and I knocked off sheets of water. So I, I, I went back in, and I said, thank you, Creator. Thank you for giving me dry. And it went by, and, uh, and I just kept there sitting there and praying. It never got wet, never got cold or nothing, because that blanket, by all, it should have soaked through. But it didn't, because of the power of prayer. You know? And, and I, I got over that stress, the high anxiety. I had high anxiety. It cured me from it. You know? So when people ask me, how do I get rid of high anxiety? Go somewhere, pray, put some tobacco down, pray. Ask the Creator to help you with that, you know. That's how you get it. That's how you have uh, taken care of, it, you know, anything, really. You know, it's how much and how, what comes from here and how you pray. Right. Also, I wanted to uh, tell everybody that a lot of people have an experience, a lot of young people have an experience, you know, nowadays, you know, they say, uh, I want a soda or something, there's a store right next door or down the street. When I was young, when I was little, my mom, my brother and I lived in a wall tent during winter, all winter long. And it was a blizzards came, cold came, but we had, it. you know, those old uh, patch blankets, quilts, what they call them? She made a whole bunch, so we lined the inside of that tent and we threw some on the outside and we, we tripled that door so cold couldn't get in there. And we put some on the, on the ground, dirt ground, and our beds are in, you know, in there. And, and we had like five, six of them covering ourselves. That's how I grew up. You know, we went inside to eat at my grand, uh, grandpa's place, but he had four of his kids in there, plus his, you know, my grandma, so there was no room, you know. And, and, and so uh, we, we, that's how we, we, you know, we spent one winter. And, and, and you look at, back at that, and that's why when I was up at Standing Rock, I was like, oh, shoot, man, I remember this. <laughs> 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 yeah, I've been there, done that. And then during wintertime, my dad worked for another uh, rancher where we lived out in the middle of nowhere. Thunderstorms came and everything, and we were in a little tent. You know, sometimes we look for tornadoes, and we were in a wall tent. You know, no vehicle, nothing, all this. Yeah, 
you know, those, those things, you know, and sometimes we'd have nothing to eat, you know, and that's how I, I, I grew up, you know. Grew, grew up uh, uh, eating squirrels and, and porcupines and turtles and whatever else, you know, those turnips that we call them team still, that grew up in the hills, we dig them. My dad used to go hunting every now and then and bring back meat. You know, and somebody's horse would get a hit, and they tell us, you know, they send runners to go and say, you know, share the meat. So it's share the meat, horse meat, you know. But that was survival. That wasn't intentional. That was survival. You know, sometimes we didn't eat for two, three days, and we, we had to, we had to, we had to do something. You know. So nowadays, young kids, you know, it's like if you're hungry, you know, get on the phone or get on your cell phone and order pizza or something. <laughs> we didn't have that. You know. So I, from that time on, and everything like the clear water, good water for, from that, and I never thought in my lifetime I would be trying to protect that water. I never thought it'd come that quick, and it came. You know? And so that's why it's so important. If it can come that quickly, what, what are our grandchildren? What is the seventh generation going to go? What will happen to them? You know? So that's that's a main that's a main thing, you know. We have to uh, we have to make a make a difference and, and, and go towards the positive. Yeah. So, and I know just like you know uh, Raymond, uh, you know I know he, he tells people too. So just a little bit, if if you put that seed in somebody's mind, you'll keep going, and tell them, you know, hey, we need to do this. All it takes is a couple of minutes. You know. Prayer and stay in prayer, because prayer. And a lot of people, you know, when they hear that, oh no, I gotta, you know, I gotta go to church and say, <laughs> but no, you can do that anywhere. You can walk outside this door, put a little bit of tobacco down, or if you don't have tobacco, I just say, hey, Creator, this is why I need help in this, you know. Or be like uh, Ryan; he carries a little pouch full of tobacco. You know, you you you, you take a little bit to pinch out. Put it down, you know, or four directions, four four pinches. Say, Creator, I need help. Tunkashi, I need help, and I need help. Or you know, when somebody is having a hard time, Tunkashi, I help that person. They're going through a hard time. They're going to the hospital. They're in ICU or something. You know, before I got here, they asked me to pray for this lady up at uh, 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 what's that one group? A riot, unicorn riot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, one, one of the people up there that was helping, and that's the only way we got the message out was through social media because they blocked the major stations from going in there to tell our story because they were violating all our rights. And they wanted to block that off. They blocked out. They tried to cut off our cell phone service, everything. Yeah. But Unicorn Riot, they were determined, and that's how the rest of the world spread out. That's was why, how the rest of the world found out what was going on, and that's how everybody came. Either they came there, or they supported in, uh, monetary-wise, or supplies, food, clothing, you know. So that's how Unicorn, but anyway, one of the, guy, the guys over there, his mother is a... Uh, um, getting close to making her journey, and they asked me to pray just before we came when I was sitting outside. So I said, you know, I said a little prayer, and I said, help her, make that journey good. You know, so try to help each other in that way. It's just little small things, but to them, it's, 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 it's major. You know, nobody wants to lose their mother, you know? It's hard. I've lost my mother and father, and, and the brother I talked about, he, I lost him too. You know, I know how it is to lose people, you know? Yeah, well, my, both my sisters, they're younger than I'm. We're spread out two, two years apart. But my younger sisters, are, they both got uh, diabetes. And so I started to pray for them. I started to pray for all the people that had diabetes. Guess what happened? I got diabetes. <laughs> you know, I was like, so gosh, you know, yeah, I know that you want me to experience this, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a reason that he has, I guess. So I just keep praying. You know, like I said, I look beyond, I look beyond racial or, 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 uh, I, look, I look beyond any kind of negativity that we have on, on the Zorro. I think about the bigger picture. I think about all of us, you know. I think that, you know, we need to do everything to survive, to love each other, to spread that love, to, to help one another. 
I have compassion for people, you know, respect, honor, everything. And then you hear over the news, you know, they're, they're starting this and they're doing this and nothing. Like, Got to pray for them, you know. It doesn't solve anything. Violence doesn't solve anything. What prayer does. Yeah. Anybody else? Any other questions? The women are, um, I think the women have uh, the major role. I think they're going to lead us into saving us, uh, seventh generation women, because uh, they're more powerful. Um, that's why, you know, you look back and, and that's why we hold women at a higher level uh, on honor, because it was uh, the white buffalo calf woman was the one that brought us that, that chinupa. And so that's how much, that, that's, that in itself is, is why women are here. And, and that's why it, anything that we do, we, we hold women a little higher and respect them and try to honor them as much as possible. Because they're the one also gave, give us life. In our ceremonies, you know, we, like for instance, our Sundance ceremony, we imitate, uh, uh, we have a skirt on instead of a, a, a jeans or anything. We have a skirt on to, to, to sacrifice to the Creator. And we pierce because that, that blood is our sacrifice. That's the only thing we can do. That's the only thing that we own is a body that that Creator gave us. We don't own anything else. We, nothing belongs to us. Everything's made and it, all, it belongs to somebody. You know, it, it, everything belongs to the Creator if you really think about it. Nothing belongs to us. And so we only have our bodies. And when we sacrifice part of that body, we are asking for help. And that's why Tsukashla is there, because it, that's the only thing we can give back to the Creator for help. And women automatically go through their monthly, and that is their purification ceremony. So the, when women go through that, and we have a ceremony, they can't be connected to that ceremony because they're more powerful than our ceremony. You know, and so we let them go through that ceremony. Even they're they're near that ceremony, we can put them away to uh, away from us to a certain spot where we can't. It won't affect us, but it's still, you know, it has to be uh, a little further, you know, uh, to the point where we they're not really close, but not yet they're not really far because we also got to protect them too. So. That's why uh, they go through their ceremony, we go through our ceremony. And that's why in our ceremonies we imitate that because, you know, somehow we, we, we look at, we're trying to do what the women, the women do and it's really powerful. It's really powerful to, uh, to get, uh, either be thankful or have prayers answered. And so that's how, that's how that works. And so that's why we hold women at a high, you know, a higher standard, you know. But also, we look at everything and everybody as equal, you know. And I, th I think it's just th those ceremonies that, 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 you know, the difference is right there. And, and, and in a way, women are always held high anyway. But in life, in general, we, everybody's equal. Uh, an ant is equal to us. Nobody's better than anybody, and nobody's less than anybody. We all are equal, you know. The king across is equal to us. A uh, little uh, spider is equal to us, you know. He's got a right to live, too. He's got a nahi, he's got a spirit, just like you, you know. So that's why, you know, I'm not saying, you know, keep looking at the ground and don't step on anything. <laughs> but, you know, they're protected, too, so, yeah. Um, you don't, it, it's, it's not like praying to them, but uh, uh, you can ask for their help. And sometimes they come and help you. That's how most of our ceremonies are, because some of them are selected to come back and help us. Um, 
but within your family members, yeah, they can come back if you pray, uh, like I said, in, in, in a good way. And the reason why, the reason why you're praying for them to come is, is, is they can and it's up to them, you know, because uh, anybody is like, say, uh, your relative passed on and you want to talk to them you, because you forgot to tell them something. And through ceremony, they can come back and talk to you. But they can't stay, they have to go back. I mean, they're just there for a short period of time. Well, anything else? I'm gonna, um, as a fellow Nebraskan, I just wanted to tell you, it's so beautiful to hear the stories I grew up with, uh -huh. as a little white kid in rural Nebraska about, about your people and that, that those are being shared here. And, yeah. and and money to Standing Rock. Oh, well, thank you. The preservation of the Ogallala Aquifer. I don't yeah. think it can be. I don't think it can be overstated how important that yep. actually is. Um, it, it is the primary water source, and, and like all of Nebraska sits on top of this. It's and most of South Dakota, parts of North Dakota, Wyoming, Colorado, Kansas, Iowa, all sit on this huge underground natural like massive lake and, and I believe it actually is the largest aquifer in the world yep um, not just the United States and um, there are people in Nebraska now ranchers who are who are standing up to Keystone getting all the way through yeah the, because the, the pipeline is planned to actually go through the aquifer yeah and you know yeah. once even, even a small amount of oil leaking into that you, you poison all of it yeah, exactly and the whole thing can't be Yeah. Hear you spreading that message. Thank you. Well, thank you. Go Huskers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I choose not to be. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but I do know to wear red on game day. <laughs> yeah, but now I'm a Bronco fan, so. I've always been a Bronco fan. <laughs> But anyway, um, it's, it's good, and, and, and like she said, you know, it's the biggest, biggest aquifer, and, and if that gets contaminated, everybody's going to have a hard time. If they're selling water now, that bottle of water you get for three, four dollars is going to go up to a hundred bucks a bottle, you know, or, be, or more. That's how much valuable, you know. Why do you think Nestle's buying up all the water around the world? I think they bought a whole bunch of, uh, I think they, 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 Oh, about the rights to all the water in, uh, what was it, uh, South America or Africa? Somewhere. Yeah, they, they bought all the rights to all the water. And they, they know. <laughs> yep. They know they can get rich off of that. All they got, and it could be intentional too. They can contaminate the aquifer and start only the... Only ones that uh, have the money will survive. Yeah. Water. Yeah. Yep. So, anyway, any anything else? Anything else you want to say? Um, just thanks everybody for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you.